Hey everyone, this is Eric Bond, the founder of Beat the GMAT, and welcome to today's Write Like an Expert series session. Today we're going to take a look at the 2012-2013 MBA admissions essay questions for the SC Johnson Graduate School of Management at Cornell University. So if you're new to the Write Like an Expert series, this is actually an annual set of webinars that we host for the Beat the GMAT community, where we ask top MBA admissions experts to join us live to analyze each essay question for the world's most competitive business schools. And joining us today, we're delighted to be co-hosting with Admissionado. Uh, Admissionado is a, a firm that's dedicated to helping applicants gain admission to the top undergraduate and graduate programs worldwide. Uh, they consider themselves to be diagnosticians, so uh, what that means is they, that the Missionado approach is to deeply assess candidate profiles to, prov to provide targeted and strategic advice for each person. And they have a pretty fantastic track record of getting their clients into uh, the top programs. Uh, our host today is going to be John Frank, who is uh, one of the co-founders of Admissionado. Uh, John is a, a real expert when it comes to admissions uh, from a personal as well as professional perspective. Uh, from a personal perspective, he actually turned down offers from Stanford, Kellogg, and other top uh, MBA programs to attend Harvard Business School himself. He has a really eclectic background too, so he's worked in a number of industries. He's been a serial entrepreneur, served as a leader uh, uh, from finance uh, to real estate uh, companies. And ultimately, his passion, though, lies with uh, this current venture, Admissionado, uh, where his passion is in helping applicants get into their dream education programs. Uh, so we're very excited to have John here again to uh, host uh, this Write Like an Expert series session for today. Uh, before I hand it off to John, I want to say a couple of words about today's structure. So John is going to go through his presentation, walking us through this year's Johnson application essay questions. And um, after the session, a member of uh, John's staff is going to stick around to answer your questions live. So if you have a question about Johnson that you'd like to get answered live during the session, there's going to be a Q&A period after the presentation. There won't be any audio or video, but it'll be a pure text-based chat uh, right on the Cornell Johnson NBA Watch comment wall. So you can post your questions as new comments right here on this comment wall page. Uh, there'll be a moderated chat, so our team will be able to see the questions coming in and publish as many as we can one by one uh, where uh, the admission out expert will will um, respond to as many of your questions as possible for the remaining time. So I hope that makes sense and uh, I think I said enough at this point so John why don't you take it away from here. Great thanks Eric so much for the uh, introduction very generous as always um, and John Frank coming at you here from uh, China I just opened up an office here in sunny Chengdu, and so thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world. Um, today we're going to talk about Cornell, we're going to talk about Johnson, specifically the essays. Uh, a lot to talk about as we'll get into, and uh, the format is actually just like in all the Write Like an Expert series. Uh, going to do a little presentation up front, and then we're going to take some Q&A afterwards. Probably talk for 30 or 4 minutes, 30 or 40 minutes rather, and then we are off to the races. So. Uh, with that, a lot of ground to cover. Let's dig into it. Plan for today. Uh, you know, we found that people like things in fives, as this picture may indicate. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna stick with this trend. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is just talk briefly about Johnson. You know, the the point of this presentation is not so that you become an expert in Johnson. There's certainly uh, websites devoted to this essay analysis, and uh, I believe are a little bit different than just a basic introduction to the school. You know what I mean? Um, so we will spend a couple of slides talking about the school, but generally we're going to focus today on the essays. Right? First there, essay number one, which essentially is tell us about the past. Essay number two, tell us about the future. Essay number three, tell us a little bit about yourself. And like I said, we're, we're going to finish up with some Q&A. Now, one of the nice things that Johnson does is they actually give you hints. Right? Some schools actually just list an essay question and then that's it. Right? Johnson lists the essay question <laughs> And then they tell you how they want you to do it. So that makes things easier. Uh, however, their hints are not complete. That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, in addition to these five issues, we're also, by the way, just going to make some general points along the way. You know, one of the things to keep in mind is that while every school is different, of course, and every application will give you the chance to argue as to why that school is just, gosh, so perfect for you, 
you know, at the same time, your best foot forward is your best foot forward. You know, your background is at its best when you're describing yourself at your best. You can't change yourself that much at this stage of the game. So yeah, there are bits and pieces that you can tweak, but at the end of the day, we believe that your best application is what it is. So yeah, we're going to tweak it, we're going to talk about Cornell. But there's going to be a lot of general pointers and tips along the way, because no matter what school you're applying to, generally, generally, your best foot forward is what it is. Now, along those lines, we're all here for the same reason, right? We all want to get into business school, so let's cut the crap right. Whether it's Johnson or any other school, what does it take to get into business school? All right, and this, by the way, is the only general slide of this kind, so humor me. Okay, the most important thing, the most important thing in an MBA application is for you to connect your past experiences to your future goals. Okay, it's not a writing contest, not a creativity contest. This is not art school. This is not theological seminary, right? Uh, connect your past experiences to your future goals. Great. Leadership. Right, we're going to talk about leadership at Cornell. Leadership is not, not just an HBS thing. Leadership is true at all schools, and especially at Johnson. Okay, work success over time. Increasing responsibility. You're a shooting star. Okay, international experience, especially for international applicants. You've got to prove that you have an international perspective. And again, we're going to talk about this in terms of Johnson in particular. Very international program. Well-roundedness and good judgment, right? Schools are judging your judgment. Are you following directions? Are you submitting a four-page resume? Uh, we are judging your judgment as we go. Okay, so what's the most important of all these things? Connecting your past experiences to your future goals. No matter what school we're applying to, this is how you get into business school. Now, just like I said before, what we're going to do is we're going to tweak this stuff, specifically for Johnson. So. Let's talk briefly just about Johnson. On the one hand, Johnson Cornell is uh, traditional, yet on the other hand, well, it's a little bit different. Let's talk about both. Okay, well, many schools focus on leadership. Many schools focus on general management. Johnson focuses on both. You know, that sounds like a lot of business schools, doesn't it? Sounds a lot like HBS, okay, where I went for business school. Now, in fact, Johnson is very different from HBS. In Johnson, there is a focus on putting principles into practice. Okay, it sounds like a nice sound bite. What does it actually mean? Um, well, HBS, how do you learn to be a leader? You know, there are no real leadership exercises per se. Uh, you will take classes on leadership. It's really very theoretical in nature. Okay, there are no students who are out there helping. There's, there, there's no special leadership program that everybody's enrolled in. Okay, at Cornell, that's not true. Cornell, you will be doing leadership exercises throughout the time there. By the way, I'm, I'm referring almost exclusively to the two-year program. Um, there are leadership exercises. There's actually a class of dedicated people, uh, their second years, who are devoted to developing your, the incoming class, leadership skills. So you're going to do exercises with these people. By the way, students at Cornell have a ton of influence. Okay, at HBS, students do not have a ton of influence. At HBS, there's this administration. I couldn't even name one person from it. Okay, at Cornell, students actually have influence. This lends itself to leadership, right? Leadership in practice. That is one of the things that makes Cornell different, right? So on the one hand, it's traditional leadership, right? That's business school. On the other hand, huh, practice, different. Okay, the same is true of general management. Again, you know, I'm reminded of HBS. Sure, there's a general management curriculum, but at HBS, Beyond the general management, there's no specificity. Okay, there's no concentration. Everyone gets the same degree. In Harvard Business School, nobody concentrates. There are no majors, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. Okay, Cornell doesn't look at it that way. Okay, Cornell, you start general, but very quickly, in your second semester, you get into this immersion learning program. Anybody who's on this call right now is probably somewhat familiar with it. It's a pretty cool thing. I don't want to get into the details now. I don't need to. Okay, but this idea of immersion learning, it begins your first year. Okay, then your second year. By the time you leave Cornell, by the time you leave the business school, you're actually a functional expert. Okay, you know how these things work. You're an expert. Okay, it's different. It's not just theory. HBS is much more theoretical. Okay, Booth is much more theoretical. All right, finally, a lot of schools claim to be international. I mean, let's overlook the fact for right now that, in fact, all American schools are right around 
international, but all schools claim to be very international. So in that way, Cornell is traditional, but how's it different? You know, their international exchange program is really interesting. It's unusual. All right. So again, uh, this exchange program, look into it. Uh, the point of this presentation is not to turn you into an expert uh, at Cornell, but all these things are worth mentioning. By the way, their one-year program is fabulous. One of the only really good pro programs of its kind. Um, let's move on. This, by the way, will be my last slide about life at Cornell. You know, I reached out when I uh, was asked to do this presentation. I reached out to a bunch of our clients and uh, former clients from Cornell. Uh, real quickly, what is life actually like? Well, obviously the class is small, 277 students, give or take, right? Intense and collaborative. Well, what makes it so intense? You know, the answer, and you can just picture the environment there, right? It's a small school. It's very, very gray. Right? What do we know about Ithaca? And what I did is I sort of uh, connected some of my own informal reaching out to our clients with some of the stuff that I dug up online. You know, it's like going to school in the sticks. All right, yeah, it's New York, man, but I got to tell you, you know, Ithaca is very, very quiet. Okay, it's very, very gray. They say they have more restaurants per capita than New York City, but what are the numbers really? 273 restaurants versus 5,000 in New York City. Um, any city that wins the best fly fishing award, I think you get the idea. Okay, so what's the point? I want to talk about essays today. What's the point in describing uh, these things that make Ithaca and Cornell unusual? Well, it's exactly that. Cornell is unusual. Okay, it's not for everybody. Okay, if you're looking for a burgeoning metropolis, it's not for you. If you're looking for just a very social, interesting scene that's intertwined with New York City, don't be fooled by the fact that this place is in New York. Okay, the gray. All right, three months out of the year, it's beautiful, it's rural. Other than that, it's cold and it's gray. All right, enough of that. Let's get into the essay. That's why we're here. Right. We used to be called Precision Essay. We're now at Mission Auto. Um, we started focusing purely on essays. So let's get into it. Essay 1, how do you characterize your career since college? All right. This is literally, if you're looking at it, this is the, the word in, from the application itself. All right. So as you can see, Johnson's giving us some hints. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is results, the importance of, of, of results. Okay, there are a lot of different ways to show results. All right, this is true for resumes, it's true for anything. You can talk about numbers, you can talk about percentages. I don't care which one you talk about. What I want you to do is talk about which one's more interesting. And don't tell me that things got better. Don't tell me that you improved operations. Okay, show me by how much. Okay, we say objectify the subjective. What does that mean? Uh, it means if you tell me that you won an award, you know, you were chosen for an award, I don't know what that means. Uh, how, how many people won that same award? I don't know. Ten? Okay, how many people were up for the award? <laughs> you know, 10? Because uh, that's bad. Now, tell me that you were one of five people who won the award out of 10,000 employees who were up for it. Oh, that's interesting. That's objective. Okay? Um, you see, the, the, the difference between the resume, and this is where most clients make the mistake. Okay, the admissions committee is generous. They tell you, hey, don't just rehash your resume. Right, what's the difference between the resume in this essay question and your essay? Well, the resume is where you're going to essentially tell us what you did. Right? I improved results this much. I did this. These were my main responsibilities. Right, you're going to walk us through it. Maybe you'll be able to show some results that way. Okay, the difference is in essays, you're going to show us how you did it. Okay, I'm going to say it again. With the resume, you can tell us what you did. In 400 words, 500 words, you just don't have a lot of choice. Okay, here, you're going to show us how you did it. How did you do it? Don't tell me that you, you know, improved results by 45%. That's going to be in your resume. Here, tell me how you did it. First, I picked up the phone and I called Bob, the head of marketing. Then I told him to schedule a meeting, which he did. Then I led the meeting and gave the presentation. Four days later, we implemented the plan that we agreed to at the meeting. Six months later, we saved money. Okay, in the resume, you'll tell us what you did. In the essay, you're going to show us how you did it. All right. Okay. Point number two: jargon. Okay, this is the other place where people make uh, mistakes. Just you know, generally when they're going through, uh, and it's different for resumes, frankly. Um, but this is where people make mistakes in this essay. Okay. At the end of the day, some people will have technical jobs. I get it. You know, you work in IT. You're Indian. 
you know, no matter what a clever consultant says, there's a certain point where you just can't help it. You know, there's going to be technical stuff. Okay, and in your resume, I'll give that to you. Fine. Now, however, in the essay, I don't buy it, not for a second. In the essay, your responsibility, okay, is to eliminate jargon. Or, if there is jargon, jargon, by the way, is technical crap that nobody but you understands. If you do need to include some jargon, you need to explain it, just like my dear, dear friend Albert Einstein said. You need to explain it simply enough that anybody can understand it. Okay, I get the complaint all the time, John, it's too complicated. If, if you think it's too complicated, brother, you know, you're, you're, you don't understand it well enough. You need to make it simple. Now, what does this mean? It means you're not going to be able to talk about everything. You're going to have to pick the things that are the most important. And that's just fine. But remember who the admissions committee is. Okay, the admissions committee is not a technical guy like you. The admissions committee is a bunch of 25-year-old HR professionals. Okay, we call it the waitress test. Right? Your waitress comes over to you at a restaurant. You explain to her what you do for a living. Is she interested? Does she understand it? Okay, if she doesn't, you're doing it wrong. Same with your 16-year-old little sister. Explain, read to her this essay. Does she understand it? And this, this is not rhetorical, by the way. Find a 16-year-old. Right? Read them your career goals essay. Okay, if she doesn't understand it, you're doing it wrong. Remember who your audience is. All right, finally, let's, let's dig even deeper into the words uh, the words from the essay question itself. You know what word I like here is characterize. How do you characterize your career? What does the word characterize mean? Okay, they don't say please recount. They say characterize. What does character mean? Character means judgment. Characterize means assign some judgment here. Who are you? What's important to you? What are you passionate about? Okay, we need judgment. Okay, we need you to think. We need your brain. And one of the most powerful ways that you will characterize this experience is you will pick the most important bits. Okay, that's how you're going to shape it. You're going to give it character. Okay, you, got, you know, it's, it's, it's as though you're developing a character for a movie. Who are you? What's your character? It's not three random things. Right? There has to be some connection between these things. You're going to pick your greatest hits. All right? Now, the way that you're going to pick them, however, is to give yourself, to give your brand, to give your application a character. All right, let's focus on that word characterize. Okay? All right, let's move on. Essay number two, the almighty career goal. Okay? Now, what you'll find is that here, essay number two, the almighty career goal, the only thing that's unusual about it, really, and it's not even that unusual, to be honest, is the fact that it's only 400 words. 400 words is not a lot. Right? We're going to talk about that more later. Um, anyway, generally, first we'll, again, we'll start general, then we'll get specific. Right? Business school is all about career goals. No matter how good your application, no matter how good a writer you are, no matter who your dad knows, if your career goals are sideways, you're not going to get in. Right? It's not rocket science. Right? It's business school. If your business plan sucks, you're not going to get in. But it isn't the essays that are important. Why are the essays important? Because that's your chance to express your career goals. That's your chance to describe your own personal business plan. Right? If your career goals are backwards, if they're sideways, you're not going to get in. Okay, so what makes a good career goal? Well, that's easy. You've got to connect your past experiences to your future goals. This is the most important, but maybe the most important thing that I ever say. Okay. What's a good career goal? It's one that connects your past experiences to your future goals. Okay, that's it. If you're doing that, you're going to be successful. Okay, if your essays reflect that you're doing that, you're going to be successful. Okay, if you're not doing that, I don't care what else falls into place, it's not going to work. All right, so we already talked about this, connecting your past experiences to your future goals. Right, there's my good friend Earl. Earl is not really a good friend, by the way, as you may have guessed. Um, but one of the questions, obviously, that comes up is, you know, hey, John, what about career changes? You know, how do I connect my past experiences to my future goals? The whole point of going to business school is I want to get out of commercial banking. Right? I get it. I get it. Okay, so let's talk about how it works. 
How do I connect my past experiences to my future goals? Okay, in the next slide, we're going to talk more specifically about Cornell. But again, this is probably more important. How do I connect my past experiences to my future goals? Well, there has to be a connection, obviously. Real estate finance into real estate development. That makes sense. And hey, I work in finance, I understand real estate, but there's a bigger picture here that I'm excited about. That's why I want to go into development. MBA makes perfect sense. I'm going to plug in those skills that I lack, add them to the ones I already have, and I'm ready to go. Same with investment management into investment banking. I know how to run an IRR. I have basic background. Okay, but I've seen just enough of the world to know that there's more to it. I want more. Okay, here's how it should not work. And we see this every year, especially from our uh, Indian clients, right? Well, I have a background in IT, but you know, I gotta tell you, I've seen so much poverty in India. I want to move into nonprofit. I want to be a nonprofit guy. You know, I, I, I don't. I mean, how do you how do you just how is that credible, right? Put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's going to hire you as a nonprofit guy. That's all the admissions committee wants, right? Is you're going to get a job. Okay, so how are you going to prove that you are credible in nonprofit if you don't have that background? You know, the answer is probably you're not going to. That's the bottom line. Now, career changes are possible. How are they possible? Well, let's back to our friend Earl. Let's see a picture of Earl. Earl is a Kiwi farmer from Guam, and he wants to be a management consultant. Is that possible? The answer is yes. How? Well, if you're listening, you know the answer. Somehow, Earl is going to connect his past experiences to his future goals, right? How are we going to do that? Well, granted, Earl doesn't want to be a Kiwi farmer for the rest of his life, but that's okay. Right? What does he want to do? Well, he's going to be a problem solver. Right? Earl is going to argue, hey, I know what consultants do. They do X, Y, Z. Guess what? That's exactly what I do as a Kiwi farmer. I'm going to be a great consultant because guess what? Even though I'm a Kiwi farmer, I already act like a consultant all day long. This is not a stretch. This isn't even a career goal. This is more of the same. We're just drawing a straight line. No, it sounds weird, but we're still connecting our past experiences to our future goals. Okay, John, how can Johnson expect me to know what I want to do with my life? You know, honestly, they don't. Okay, but what they're doing is they're judging your judgment. What's your judgment? Can you come up with a good plan that makes sense? Can you sell me on a smart business plan for yourself? Because if you can sell me, maybe you'll sell the guy that hires you when you graduate from my school. Do you know what business school is? Do you get it? Okay, granted, of course, you may change your mind. Of course you will. Everyone does. Now, I'll tell you a dirty little secret. A lot of people will write the career goals that they think that business schools want to hear. And I'm guilty of this as well. And I'm not here to tell you that that's a smart thing or a stupid thing to do. Um, I said when I applied to business school, I want to get into real estate. Cornell, by the way, great real estate program. I said I want to go into real estate. Uh, in fact, the reason I was going to business school was because I hated real estate. I wanted to get out of real estate. Okay, but I didn't say that. I said I wanted to go into real estate. I wanted to stay there. I wanted to move into development, blah, blah, blah. Here's what happened. When I graduated, I actually ended up staying in real estate. I actually ended up doing exactly what I said I was going to do. Why? Well, because I'm smart. You know, and I realized that the admissions committee wants to know what my best bet is. What am I? Look at my resume. I'm a real estate guy. In 2005, I'm a real estate guy. That's it. So sure enough, two years later, when job offers came in, I could either make 60 grand working in LA in the music business, or I could make three times that working in real estate. Okay, so yeah, you may you may think that you're only doing what the admissions committee wants, but in fact, guess what? There's a good chance that whatever you write is what you're going to do. All right, this will be the last slide, and we'll get very Johnson specific here. Okay, we already talked in the in the career goal about connecting your past experiences to your future goals. Okay, here's the thing. I'm going to skip right down to number number four. Okay, why Johnson specifically, given your unique past and your unique future? You know, typically somebody's applying to Johnson. We've already talked about Johnson's very unique, right? Johnson's an unusual place. Small, intense, practical, cool programs, international, Ithaca, all these things. It's unique, right? Now, somebody writes in their career goals essay, you know, they ask specifically why Johnson, and you're going to say, oh, well, I want to take this finance class with this professor. He's a great professor. Also, I want to join the entrepreneurship club. Also, I want to take this venture capital class. 
also, uh, I want to work in an international environment. Okay, here's my problem. Every single school has all of those things. Every school has an entrepreneurship club. Every single one. I, I would argue that every college even has an entrepreneurship club. Okay, Wanting to join the entrepreneurship club is not a reason to go to Cornell. Okay, how about their big red club? They, they've got this cool thing that's actually different. Their financial management uh, program. I mean, the point is, okay, you need to find things that are actually truly unique. So what? You found that there's a, a fancy finance professor and you say you want to work with them. So what? There are fancy finance professors everywhere. Probably there's a fancier finance professor at Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, Booth. Right? Simply listing this guy's name is not a good enough reason to want to go to Johnson. I don't care, there's a fancy finance professor. Why Johnson? Okay, now, how about this? Show me there's a guy that specializes in your field. How about that? You know, you want to do private equity in China. Now show me that, you know, the leading voice in Chinese private equity happens to be a professor at Johnson. Now that's interesting. That's different. That's not just I want to work with this professor. Right? Prove to me why Johnson. No, I want to. I want to work in a small environment. I want to work. I like that it's you know the teacher, the professor to student ratio is low, and I, you know I do well in small groups. I don't care. Anybody can say that. What is it specifically about your background? Prove it to me. Everybody will say, oh, and by the way, I want to go to a small school. Okay, that's not compelling. It's not good enough. That's not why Johnson. Why does your background specifically lend itself to a small school? Okay. Everybody will list good things about the school, and a lot of those good things are true about any school. So what? It's small. So is Tuck. So is Babson. Why Johnson? Okay, I hope that's clear. All right, SA3. Now, this is where it gets fun. John, they're, they're, they're very clear this year. They want you to be interesting. They want you to be creative. Okay, you have three options for this essay number three. Okay, we're going to talk about all of them. Um, by the way, you know we're going to be done here in you know, 10 or 15 minutes anyway, so um, stay with me here. Let's start with the table of contents. This is one of my favorite ones to edit. Why? Because it's actually interesting. You know, 400 words is like nothing. It's like nothing. I mean, you're, as, as you get into this essay, you're going to see. You know, by the time you get to like chapter three, you're done. <laughs> you know, so you you got to be very very smart. Now, one place I always recommend people start is this guy J. Martin Troost. Check out any one of his books. Okay, online you can find any of his tables of contents for free. Now you can sort of scan it at Amazon.com or whatever. He is the undisputed king of the table of contents. Check him out. By the way, his books are all hysterical and awesome. Um, but all, all we care about right now is the table of contents. He will show you how to do a creative table of contents. Okay, now, very specifically, one of the things you're going to have to deal with with this table of contents is, am I going to push into the future? Is my table of contents going to push out into times that haven't happened yet. 2012. Is my table of contents going to include 2015, 2020, 2050? I don't know. Sounds interesting. Maybe it should. Okay, just an idea. All right. In 400 words, by the way, we talk about, uh, you know, generally, John, you know, do I need to stick within 400 words? The answer is no. Uh, you have roughly 10% to play with, but you don't want to play with it on every essay. Um, my gut is if you can bring all of your other essays in within the 300 and 400 limit, this will probably be where you want to use that extra 10%, 5%, 10%. You're just going to need it. Okay, the other thing you can do with this essay, by the way, is just cover tons and tons of ground. You've got 1,100 words total for this Cornell application. This is where you can cram a bunch of stuff in. All those stories that you want to tell, you know, by boiling it down, you're going to get to tell some pretty cool stories. All right? Now, here's some other ideas on uh, this particular essay. Now, look, they're asking for unique. They're asking for creative. They're begging you for it. They didn't always give you these hints that they want you to be creative. Don't write a boring table of contents. All right, these are just some ideas, things that we've seen through the years. Maybe you can use pictures. That's an interesting idea, right? Why the hell not? What about web links? What about, hey, then I founded this website. Put the website up there. Make them click through it. That's interesting, right? These are ways you can cover more real estate. You can cover more ground. Pictures have no words. You know, maybe it's 400 words, but maybe it's 500 pictures. Okay, I'm overstating, but you get the idea. 
Okay, generally with creative essays, and this is not the only example of one, but there are two ways to be creative. Okay, the first way is um, with the formatting. Okay, what is this table of contents going to look like? Is it going to be on a piece of parchment paper? What is the format? Is it going to be in Excel? Is it going to be a, a picture? What's the format? Okay, the other way is make the actual text itself creative. Maybe the whole thing is a fantasy and somehow it's an allegory for your life. I don't know. The point is two ways to be creative. And this is true for the NYU essay. It's true for the UCLA essay. By the way, it's also true for the Booth essay. Um, all these you know, creative, open-ended essays. Two ways to be creative. One is through the formatting, the packaging, if you will. The other is through the actual content itself. Um, anyway, folks, be creative. These are just some ideas. You know, it's a really cool essay question. My recommendation would be to use this one. And we're going to talk about we'll talk about that a little bit. Go forward to right. option B, failure. All right. Let's start with what not to do. Okay, there's a very common. I did this by the way when I was applying for jobs out of college. You know, they ask you in an interview, "What's a failure? What's a weakness?" And you sort of come up with like one that's BS. You know, it's like, oh, well, I'm a perfectionist, and it means that I don't get all of my work done sometimes because I'm trying so hard to do such a good job. You know, that's baloney, and admissions committees will see right through it. It's just, it's just so boring. Okay, it's a waste of time. Okay, don't try to avoid this question. Don't try to sidestep it. Don't try to squeeze in one of your accomplishments here. Okay, own it. Okay, I want a belly flop. Okay, a sign of maturity is to know your weaknesses and to admit to your failures. That's what I want you to do. Now, the question is, what failures do you choose? And here's the answer. Okay, you pick a failure that highlights your strengths. I'm going to say it again. Pick a failure that highlights your strengths. I'll give you an example. Okay, my strength is leadership. Okay, people listen to what I say. I'm able to get things done. I inspire people. I'm good at talking in front of computer screens. Um, you get the idea. Public speaking. Later today, I'm going to speak at Citibank here in China. It's exciting. It's what I do. Now, the problem is, I'm very bad at details. Okay, if 10 people didn't email me today to remind me to be on this webinar, I probably would have forgotten about it. Details are my downfall. Now, the good news is that the guy who's a good leader, it makes sense that he's bad at details, right? The weakness actually reinforces the strength. Okay, pick a failure that makes your strengths seem stronger. All right, let's get even more specific right, for this essay number three. If you do choose the failure, and this, by the way, is my second favorite out of the three essay number three options. This is, uh, you know, I think your second best up. It, you know, it's, it's just a little bit boring. You know, they're begging for you to be creative. You know, and you're going to write a story about, you know, I mean, think about it, right? Your first essay is about work. Your, this is for Johnson. Your first essay is about work. Your second essay is about work. And now you're going to write another failure. You know, maybe it's about work or some extracurricular. It's just boring. Right? I don't like this essay as much as essay one. My recommendation, and listen, we go, you know, I tell you what I think. There's no politics here, um, for better and for worse. I like essay number one better. But my second favorite is essay number two. Um, and the reason is, that, you know, there, there is a format to it. Part one, lay out the belly flop. Hey, here's what, here's what happened. I was ready to do great. I had all this responsibility. And sure enough, boom, you know, belly flop. I screwed up. I lost my company millions of dollars. The bigger the belly flop, the better. Because that means that at some point somebody trusted you. <laughs> right? If your belly flop was small, uh, it's, it's just a boring story. It means you never had any responsibility. Right? People make mistakes. That's how you get better. I haven't, I'm, I'm a skier. I haven't fallen in 10 years. That's probably why I haven't gotten better in at least that long. Okay, part one, lay out the belly flop. Part two, reflect. Right? What are the lessons? As soon as you belly flop, right, now your stomach hurts. Now you're screwed. Right? You're sitting in the water and you're like, wow, what went wrong? How come that wasn't a dive? How come that turned into a belly flop? Oh, wait a minute. You know, I forgot to tuck in my chin. Huh. That's interesting. Wait a minute. I don't, I don't know how to swim. Huh. Okay, reflect. But gosh, right, you learned the lesson. Now, part three is you revisit that situation. Okay, six months later, I was in a similar situation, faced with similar facts. This time, though, I nailed it. I nailed it, right? Think Christina Applegate in that scene in Anchorman. I nailed it, right? Hopefully somebody follows me there. Um, crushed it. Second time around, you learned the lesson. Prove to me, right? Don't just tell me that you learned the lesson. Remember what we said. This is an essay. Show it to me. Prove it to me. 
that you learned the lesson. Walk me through it. I gotta tell you, in 400 words, that's gonna be a challenge. Now, here's uh, the third essay. Uh, by the way, uh, jot down some questions if you would. Just got a couple more slides here before we get into uh, Q&A. Um, essay three, diversity. How will you contribute to diversity at Johnson? Well, we already talked about greatest hits, right? Now, if you're an international applicant in particular, right, what we talk about is CSI, creativity, soft skills, and international experience. Why? Well, the assumption is that Chinese people, Indian people, they have trouble with these things. Now, is that true? Uh, I don't care. But if you are a Chinese applicant, your job in this essay is to show that you have these things. Right? Some version of CSI. Okay, somehow you got to prove that this is not a weakness. Now, this is a very tricky essay to write. Why? Well, because in, in America, as it turns out, and I didn't really realize this until I got to China, you know, Americans are, are really quite focused on being politically correct. I was asked a question by my Chinese teacher yesterday. She looked at me and she said, John, are you getting fat or strong? I'm thinking to myself, gosh, that's, that's sort of mean. Like, actually, you know, actually, I've been going to the gym, you know, I'm pumping up, I think it's working. Um, but she didn't mean to be offensive. Um, but, you know, by my American standards, uh, it was somewhat offensive. Uh, we need to be careful, right? In this essay, there are a lot of traps here. One is, you know, this sort of culturally falling, you know, stepping on somebody's toes by mistake. Skipping to the bottom of this slide, another very common trap that we see is uh, the idea that you end up with stereotypes. You know, you're con I've seen this so many times, the conclusion is, you know, I learned that cultures are different and I need to adapt, or worse yet, you know, and that's the day that I learned that Americans talk very loudly, you know, and they can be very obnoxious and they don't mean it personally. And that was the day that I learned that, you know, Indians are this way or that way, you know, that's not the lesson that you want to learn here. Okay, the other trap, by the way, that people fall into is, the question, right, is what does diversity mean to you? A lot of people will simply define diversity. Oh, diversity, to me, diversity is the ability of different groups from different places being able to work together. You know, cousin brother, that, that's not what diversity means to you. That's actually just what diversity means. That's what, that's what the definition of diversity is if I look at it at a dictionary. Or don't do that. Okay, finally, last point I want to make here before we move on, and then we're pretty much done, is uh, remember it's business school. Okay, so, you know, you're going to tell a very, very sad story about somebody in your family who died. Okay, or you're going to tell a story about the time that you felt uncomfortable because you were eating spicy food and you weren't used to it and you found yourself in Chengdu. Remember, folks, this is business school. This isn't meaning of life school. This isn't I'm on my own personal journey of self, you know, self personal awareness and fulfillment school. This is business school. Okay? So th this is not to say that every essay should be business related. That's patently not true. Not every essay should be business related. Okay, but even lessons that you're learning in your personal life, you're not going to be, you're not going to get credit for being a minority. You're not going to get credit for being gay. You're not going to get credit for moving to China as an American, not speaking, or as a Lao Wai, not speaking a word of Chinese. What you're going to get credit for is the skills that you gained based on that experience. Not because those skills make you a better person. Not because those skills help you become, you know, a, a nicer guy or to live a richer life. Right? But it's because those skills eventually, ultimately, will actually make you better at business. Those are skills that at some point translate into business skills. Don't ever forget. Okay, this is business school. All right, last slide here. Um, you know, Johnson is unique in many ways, and, and we didn't get into that in, uh, in specifics. Uh, they're pl you know, sign up for any of their many online webinars, check out their website, um, check out our essay analysis, you know, all these things to get more details on the school itself. You know, I focus today on the essay question, but don't ever forget, Cornell is very different. Johnson is very different. If you do a bad job of proving why you are a good fit there, you're not going to get in. I don't care how good your credentials are. Okay, Harvard assumes if you get in, you're going to go. Okay, Cornell, not necessarily. Prove it. Okay, Cornell is unique. Why are you perfect for that particular school? Obviously, everyone's got to connect your past experiences to your future goals. Um, you know, in 1,100 words, holy crap, you don't have a lot of uh, a lot of leeway. It's going to be very hard to cover a lot of ground. 
And again, that, that's why I like essay number one, or rather essay A, the first option of essay three, right? The table of contents. You cover ground there, man. Do it. Do it all day long. Um, you know, that, that diversity essay is the toughest by far. Toughest by far. You gotta cover a lot of ground in, in 1,100 words. Um, we already talked about the to the culture. You know, and at the end of the day, uh, remember the, the point that I started with, all, all the things that we're talking about, you know, very little of it is true exclusively for Cornell. Check out their website. What is Cornell focused on? Management, leadership. Huh. That sounds pretty universal, doesn't it? I right. prove to them that you love their school, prove to them that you're a perfect fit for the school, okay, and you check that box. At the end of the day, all you're doing is you're picking your best stories, you're putting your best foot forward. Okay, and you're going to show that you're qualified, that you're a shooting star, that you're a leader, that you're going to take over this world in, in whatever area you're going to focus on. And remember, you're going to have a chance to focus in Cornell. Whatever area it happens to be, so you're going to take it over and be very successful. You're going to be a leader in the business world. And that's not just for Cornell folks, it's for everybody. Oh, sorry, one, one additional slide here, just real briefly about my company. Uh, we've done about 12,000 MBA applications over the past five years. So a lot of what we do is international. You know, I'll, I'll be honest, I'll just cut sort of to the chase here. You know, we've seen everything. You know, I love this stuff. I worked, before I started this company, I worked for a number of years in real estate and finance. You know, I was successful in Chicago. I own a few properties there. Um, but I just like this a lot more. You know, I learn a lot. I, I love tough cases. I love reapplications. I love it when, when schools change their applications from year to year. This is, uh, this is fun for me. This is really exciting. Um, and uh, that's who I am. That's what I do. The company used to be Precision Essay. Now it's Admission Auto. Uh, we're growing up, but the focus is the same. All right, folks. With that, I'm done for now. Let's uh, flip it over to Eric, and let's take a few questions. John, thank you so much for that great presentation. For those of you who might have joined us a little bit late, we've been listening to John Frank, who is the co-founder of Admission Auto, walk through his analysis of this year's 2012-2013 Johnson at Cornell MBA application essay questions. So at this point, we are ready to take your questions live. If you have a question about Cornell um, and uh, would like to have it, your question answered live, you can post your question as a new comment right here on the MBA Watch comment wall for Johnson at Cornell. Uh, we are very pleased to be joined by Richard, who is an expert at Mission Auto, who is going to be standing by to answer your questions. So this is going to be a moderated chat. We're going to see uh, your questions coming in through this MB Watch page, and we'll publish those questions one by one to have Richard respond to, and we'll try to get through as many of your questions as possible for the remaining time. So uh, there's not going to be any more audio or video at this point, but I do want to say before, before wrapping up uh, that uh, it's been a real privilege and pleasure to uh, co-host this session today with our friends at Admissionado. So definitely check, in, check out admissionado.com after this session. And also a very big thank you to you guys as well, to our audience members, for joining us for today's session. And uh, we hope to see you at a future Write Like an Expert series session. So uh, thanks very much, and we're going to take your questions right now.